Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome. My name is Jamie Boskett, and I have the honor of serving as president and CEO of the Virginia Historical Society and the privilege of welcoming you all here tonight to the Virginia Museum of History and Culture and specifically to our beautiful Robbins Family Forum. We're thrilled to have such a full house for this, this uh, talk tonight. As many of you know, the Virginia Historical Society, and I say this for the benefit of some of our MCV friends that are with us this evening, the Virginia Historical Society is the oldest cultural organization in the Commonwealth of Virginia and one of the oldest and most respected history organizations in this great nation. Uh, we are the proud keepers of this ever-evolving and growing history museum and library, and the proud keepers of a collection of nearly nine million items, one of the largest history collections in this nation uh, that represent this incredible, ever-evolving story of the Commonwealth of Virginia. So a perfect place for us to talk history this evening. Uh, we are deeply pleased tonight to be partnering with the MCV Foundation yet again. Uh, I'd especially like to thank former MCV Foundation and current Virginia Historical Society trustee, Austin Brockenbrow, who is with us this evening for suggesting that our two organizations work together. It has been a wonderful match. Austin, where's Austin? There's Austin. Thank you, sir. <laughs> this, the second of three programs we're planning together, fulfills the missions very clearly of both organizations by raising awareness of outstanding medical research, care, and education that happens each and every day on the MCV campus and linking past and present by exploring the historical foundation on which that work is built. Tonight's program, The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History, offers an in-depth account of the devastating flu outbreak that claimed the lives of as many as 100 million people worldwide 100 years ago, and of course with direct ties to World War I. Uh, in fact, I hope that uh, tonight's uh, talk on this important topic will inspire you to come back and visit the museum and to see our own exhibition just upstairs, The Commonwealth and the Great War, which speaks broadly to Virginia's important role in World War I and specifically to the impacts of the flu here in the Commonwealth. Again, it's, it's my pleasure, deep pleasure to be with you, to welcome you all here, and now to welcome forward uh, my partner in this venture, Margaret Ann Baumeyer, president of the MCV Foundation, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Jamie, and thanks to your team and all of the members of the uh, Virginia Historical Society Board who have partnered with us in this wonderful event, and also for uh, having such a beautiful venue for it. Um, I do also want to recognize Austin Brockenbro and, and mention that he's actually a lifetime a member of our board. Uh, he really, he came up with this idea, he brought the two organizations together because he thought there were a lot of people who would be interested in history and medicine, and that we don't talk enough about medical history. And with VCU having such a rich medical history in the Medical College of Virginia, there is a lot to talk about. So we're, we're very pleased to be here tonight. I also want to recognize one of our board members who's here, Charlie Bryan, who's in the middle of the room. Charlie, right here, raising his hand. Yeah. Charlie has not only been a just a, a wonderful and critical member of our board, many of you know he's the former president and CEO of the Virginia Historical Society um, and was here for many years. And a lot of the work that you see here has his stamp on it. I also want to recognize one more person who I believe um, was planning to be here, Dr. Walter Lawrence. Are you here, Dr. Lawrence? Back in the back. Thank you so much for being here. Dr. Lawrence is a professor of surgery emeritus and director emeritus of the VCU Massey Cancer Center. We're so happy to see you here tonight. Finally, I want to thank our sponsor tonight. We're very pleased to have this event underwritten by the Virginia Sergeant Reynolds Foundation, and they, their sponsorship has really made this possible. So we're very grateful to the Virginia Sergeant Reynolds Foundation. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, John Barry. John M. Barry was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and he attended Brown University. He is a prize-winning and New York Times best-selling author whose book, the Great Influenza, 
the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, a study of the 1918 pandemic, was named by the National Academies of Sciences as their year's outstanding book when it was originally published in 2004. The book was uh, revised and updated and republished again this year, just in time for um, the 100th anniversary of the great flu pandemic. He is, one, he is a writer who has won a number of awards. In 2005, he also won the September 11th award from the Center of Biodefense and Emerging Pathogens at Brown University. He has served on the federal government's Infectious Disease Board of Experts, on the advisory board of MIT's Center for Engineering Fundamentals, and on the advisory committee at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health for its Center for Refugee and Disaster Response. In 2004, the National Academies of Science asked him to give the keynote speech at its first international scientific meeting on pandemic influenza. And in addition to serving on the government's Infectious Disease Board of Experts, he was a member of the original team which developed plans for mitigating a pan pandemic by using non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as taking public health measures to take what public health measures you would take before um, if a vaccine is not available or before a vaccine becomes available. Both the Bush and Obama administrations have sought his advice on influenza preparedness and response, and he continues his activity in this area. On a more personal note, before becoming a writer, Barry coached football at the high school level and at many colleges. Um, in fact, he was on the team at Brown University when he was in college. Um, he told me earlier tonight that he coached a, 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 a player who became a doctor who's here, to, who's here and may be here tonight, but who lives here in Richmond. He is currently the Distinguished Scholar at Tulane's Bywater Institute and an adjunct, adjunct faculty at the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. He lives in New Orleans. And he came here um, to be with us tonight to talk to to talk with us about the 100th anniversary of the Great Flu Pandemic. John, will you join us? Thank you, Thank you, so thank you very much, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Let me start my timer. <laughs> I don't want to talk too long. Uh, I guess we'll just get into it. On September 14th, 1918, almost exactly 100 years ago, you all know that, uh, Paul Lewis walked into the isolation ward of the Philadelphia Naval Hospital. He was an MD, but he'd never actually treated a patient. He was a member of the first generation of laboratory scientists that America had ever produced. In 1908, he proved polio was a viral disease and he produced a vaccine 100% effective in protecting monkeys against polio. In researching the books, I talked to two scientists whose fathers were also scientists and who knew Lewis, who called him the smartest man that they had ever known. But what he found in that isolation ward astounded him. There was blood everywhere, but it wasn't from wounds. Uh, it was bleeding from an infectious disease. He didn't know what caused the disease, nor whether he could ever find a vaccine to prevent it. But despite that unusual symptom, he believed he knew what the disease was. He thought it was influenza, unlike any influenza that he had ever seen before. That's 100 years ago. Last year, when Tom Frieden, the last director of CDC, uh, left office, uh, the Washington Post asked him what kept him up at night and what he worried about most. And he said, quote, his biggest fear was influenza. He called it the nightmare scenario. It's always the worst case. So let me explain why that is. Essentially, all influenza viruses are bird viruses. That's a natural reservoir from, for all of them. 
but it's one of the fastest mutating viruses in existence. So it allows it to jump species. When a single virus infects a single cell, somewhere between eight hours and 24 hours later, that one cell will produce between 100,000 and a million virus particles. I don't call them viruses because 99% of those particles are defective. They are incapable of infecting any other organism. But that still leaves 1% of a vast number that can infect. So you can see every possible permutation of the virus is going to be produced. In addition, the virus has an unusual, most, most organisms have their, their uh, genetic material on a continuous strand of DNA or in, in uh, its RNA for, for influenza. But influenza actually has genes on eight separate segments of RNA. So if two different influenza viruses infect the same cell, which will happen, it's like they can trade segments, like shuffling two different decks of cards together and come out with a new virus. Uh, that's called reassortment. So you have two ways for the virus to jump species. We're actually pretty familiar with the reassortment, but it, at least hypothetically, can also jump directly from one species to another just because it mutates so rapidly. Three to five times a century, about as far back as we can look in history, uh, there have been influenza pandemics. Uh, it was second only to smallpox in killing Native Americans, a distant second, but still had pretty high death toll from influenza. You don't need airplanes to have a pandemic. It managed to, uh, a pandemic in, in 1698, managed to cross the Atlantic and infect uh, North Americans in, in severe uh, both in Virginia and, and in Massachusetts. Uh, but I want to tell you the story of 1918, and then get into some of the lessons, then talk a little bit about the future. We don't know where the 1918 virus entered the population. And in my book, I actually presented a hypothesis, uh, which I probably abandoned myself by now because of some evidence from molecular biology that wasn't available back then. Uh, there's some evidence that it started in the United States, uh, in Kansas. Uh, some evidence of China, some in Vietnam, but we, we don't really know and we probably never will know. The first, it came in waves as other pandemics that we know about uh, came in, whether that we, 1889, there was a pandemic, which we know a little bit about. 1918, obviously, we know a lot about. 1957, 1968, 2009, which is sort of marginal as a pandemic. But they all came in waves. In 1918, the first wave was generally very mild. How mild? In the British Grand Fleet, which patrolled the coast of Europe, 10,313 sailors were sick enough that they were missed duty with influenza, but there were only four deaths. That's about as mild as you can get. However, there were some pockets in the spring of, of virulence that hinted at a different outcome. It was a single army base in France where nearly 10% of the entire unit, of the population of the entire unit, died. In, in the spring, Louisville uh, had a pretty violent outbreak, pretty much comparable to the second wave, which came in the fall. But by and large, again, uh, it, it continued to be mild. Uh, it may have affected the war. Ludendorff, the German general, blamed it for the failure for his last great offensive. Uh, personally, I doubt that. There was influenza on both sides. Uh, Kind of reminds me of uh, a football game when Penn State years ago lost to, uh, I think it was Navy, and after a big upset. And after the game, uh, some commentator asked Joe Paterno, "Well, do you really think the uh, the rain is, is the you know very heavy rain was why you lost?" 
and Paterno said he wasn't sure because he was only on his sideline, but he thought it was likely that on the other sideline it was raining also. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not part of my speech, but I figured I'd throw it in. I started thinking that's kind of the way I view Ludendorff's excuse making. Uh, but at some point, a far more lethal virus emerged. The first widespread lethality occurred in July in Switzerland. It was dangerous enough that a US military intelligence report, stamped top secret, uh, said that it was being called influenza, but in reality, it was bubonic plague from the Middle Ages. It wasn't bubonic plague. It was influenza. Uh, as we know now, we think there are probably somewhere at least 50 million and possibly 100 million people died. If you adjust for the world population, that's today, that would be equal to 225 million to 450 million dead in today's population. Two thirds of those died in about 14 weeks. So you compress that death toll, and you compare that to AIDS, which is a fraction of that, even without adjusting for population, it, uh, it's much less than the death toll of 1918. And of course, it's been stretched over decades. Uh, two thirds of the dead, this is very unusual for influenza, uh, two thirds of the dead uh, were between 18 and 49 years old. Most often, influenza kills the elderly, people with uh, weakened immune systems and so forth, or, or children. In 1918, well over 90% of the excess mortality was people under 65. And among medical professionals and public health people, the death toll among otherwise healthy young adults gets a tremendous amount of attention, but Children also died in large numbers. And in children age one to four, if an equivalent number of kids age one to four died today, it would equal all cause deaths for children of that age group for a 23 year period. And again, this is all happening within a matter of weeks. To put a more human face on this, if, or perhaps inhuman, I want to read to you uh, a letter that an Army physician at Camp Devens above Boston, which was the first Army base hit by the lethal wave of the pandemic, what he wrote a colleague. These men start with what appears to be an ordinary attack of La Grippe or influenza, and when brought to the hospital, they very rapidly develop the most vicious type of pneumonia that has ever been seen. Two hours after admission, they have the mahogany spots on the, over the cheekbones. And a few hours later, you can begin to see the cyanosis. Cyanosis is when you turn blue from lack of oxygen. You can see the cyanosis extending from their ears and spreading all over the face until it is hard to distinguish the colored men from the white. It is only a matter of a few hours then until death comes. It is horrible. One can stand it to see one, two, or 20 men die, but to see these poor devils dropping like flies We've been averaging about 100 deaths per day. Pneumonia means in about all cases death. We've lost an outrageous number of nurses and doctors. It takes special trains to carry away the dead. It beats for several days there were no coffins and the bodies piled up something fierce. It beats any sight they had in France after a battle. Goodbye, old pal. God be with you till we meet again. Now, some of the symptoms of this disease, influenza, were horrific. They weren't only the ordinary symptoms. Initially, early in the pandemic, it was misdiagnosed as dengue because, which, as you may know, is, is called breakbone fever, give you an idea of those symptoms, uh, because the body aches were so intense, or, or cholera, uh, because there were abdominal symptoms, which aren't, aren't normal in influenza. Uh, but people were bleeding not only from their nose and mouth, but also from their 
eyes and ears. Uh, the cyanosis, which I referred to a minute ago, obviously that ended up spreading rumors of Black Plague, including U.S. military intelligence in, in Switzerland. Now, after bird flu first erupted, uh, just about the time my book came out, uh, pathologists doing autopsies reported findings, quote, not previously described in influenza, unquote. That statement is an error. There's not a single pathology finding uh, since bird flu surfaced that was not reported in 1918. Yeah. Virtually every single organ uh, could be found suffering some uh, damage. Overall, the case mortality in the United States was probably no more than 2.5% and probably a little bit less. But the overall case mortality numbers are actually meaningless because in different demographic groups, uh, there were totally different experiences. Uh, again, since most of the deaths occurred in people between 18 and, and 49 years old, uh, in the Army bases, the case mortality where the best medical care in the country was, was in the medical camps, more than a third the doctors and nurses in the United States were in the military at that time. You still had an average case mortality of 6.5% in the military. In some of the civilian populations, it was actually worse not just case mortality, but mortality. Metropolitan Life Insurance found that of the entire population of minors in that same age group, 6.21% died, entire population. And we're talking about in a period of weeks. Among factory workers, they found 3.2% of all the factory workers in their study died. And so you multiply probably somewhere between 20 and 40 percent would, would get sick, so the case mortality would be probably triple that, possibly higher. In 13 studies of pregnant women in the United States, the case mortality ranged from 23 percent to 71 percent. In the British Army in India, case mortality for Caucasian troops was 9.6 percent, for Indian troops, 22 percent. In the Fiji, and in Areas that had not seen influenza, seasonal influenza, you did get some cross protection from having been exposed to an influenza virus. If you had never seen an influenza virus before, if you were what was called a virgin population, such as some islands in the Pacific, the mortality was much worse. In the Fiji Islands, 14% of the entire population died in 16 days. In Samoa, Western Samoa, 22% of the entire population died. There are reports from uh, Eskimo villages in Alaska and jungle villages in the middle of Africa of 100% mortality. Now, in those cases, most likely they didn't exactly all die of the disease, but there was no one, everybody got sick at the same time. There was nobody even to keep people hydrated, uh, much less care for them plus you have the psychological impact of everybody around you dying. So that's the disease. How did it affect society? Well, you've got to understand the context, and I'll talk about the United States, which is what I, I studied most closely. Uh, we were, of course, at war. And in that war, uh, there was a law, the Sedition Act, which made today's Patriot Act look like a resolution passed by the American Civil Liberties Union. <laughs> it made it punishable by 20 years in prison to, quote, utter, write, print, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government of the United States, period. It didn't say truth was a defense. And they, this was not a joke. This wasn't something passed, ignored. This was, this was enforced. 
a United States congressman was sentenced to 15 years in jail for violating that act. The government uh, created something called the Committee for Public Information, and the architect of that committee said, truth and falsehood are arbitrary terms. The force of an idea lies in its inspirational value. It matters very little if it's true or false. Now, we had, they had 100,000 what they called four-minute men who would give a brief speech to keep morale up before every public meeting of any kind, every vaudeville show, every movie theater, uh, every school board meeting, any function like this. And they were fed these lines to give out on a regular basis. And the whole idea was to keep morale up, not to criticize anything. Uh, they banned songs with the title, I Wonder Who's Kissing Her Now. You couldn't, you couldn't that song was, it was banned from every military camp, as were others, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, it's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> uh, and when you take this and move it to the arrival of the pandemic, the lethal wave of the pandemic, there was this focus on keeping the, everybody's morale up, not saying a negative word, and you had national public health leaders saying something like, quote, this is ordinary influenza by another name, unquote. Uh, it was referred to as Spanish influenza. It did not, of all the hypotheses as to where it started, we know it did not start in Spain. But Spain was not at war. And when it hit Spain in the spring, its papers printed news of it. The king got sick, which got more publicity, and hence it became known as Spanish influenza. Uh, another national health official said, the so-called Spanish influenza is nothing more or less than old-fashioned grip, unquote. The Surgeon General of the United States said, quote, there is no cause for alarm if proper precautions are observed, unquote. And local uh, public health officers were no better. In Iowa, a physician who headed a committee organized to fight the disease said, quote, there is no question that by a right attitude of the mind, these people have kept themselves from illness. I have no doubt that many persons have contracted the disease through fear, unquote. <laughs> the Chicago Health Commissioner said in his official report, reported, Quote, nothing was done to interfere with the morale of the community, unquote. The Los Angeles public health director said, quote, if ordinary precautions are observed, there is no cause for alarm. This tactic of constant reassurance never stopped. Philadelphia, which is a city I happen to focus on because it was so hard hit, made it dramatic, <laughs> uh, when they finally closed schools, ban public gatherings, ban church services, ban closed saloons. One of the newspapers there actually went so far as to say, this is not a public health measure. There is no cause for alarm. <laughs> so how stupid did they think people were? You have horrific symptoms. You have deaths often you know, not like 20%, but often enough in less than 24 hours. You literally had priests in Philadelphia driving horse-drawn carts through the streets, calling upon people to bring out their dead. So reassurances like people knew this was not ordinary influenza by another name. People knew that taking ordinary precautions are not going to protect you from this disease. So the reassurance quickly became counterproductive. This disconnect between what people were being told and the truth led to an alienation. And the relatively low case mortality actually was almost more frightening. Because when you got your first symptoms, you did not know whether your, your case or your spouse or your kid, whether they were going to progress to a lethal form of the disease and die, or whether they were going to have ordinary influenza 
such as we are all familiar with. It's like every family was playing Russian roulette when somebody got sick. So the result was that unlike in most disasters, which routinely bring out the best in people, and people making huge sacrifices to help one another. In 1918, and including in other disease scenarios, in 1918, society began to dissolve. Now, personally, I think that when you come right down to it, society is based on trust. And when people lose trust, it's everybody for himself or herself. And that began to be the case in 1918. In Philadelphia, where they repeatedly called for volunteers and nobody was responding, finally the head of the volunteer organization was scornful and said in the paper, quote, hundreds of women who sit back and had the vanity to imagine that they were capable of great sacrifice. Nothing seems to rouse them now. They have been told that there are families in which every member is ill and which the children are starving because there is no one to give them food. Still, they hold back. And this wasn't just happening in big cities. In rural areas, the same thing was happening. The Red Cross was reporting incidents where even a woman's sister wouldn't bring them food, his, her sister's family food because she was so frightened. Uh, and the Red Cross reported, quote, people starving to death not from lack of food, but because the well were panic-stricken and would not go near the sick, unquote. Uh, the result, as one person said, it kept people apart. You couldn't play with your playmates, your classmates, your neighbors. The fear was so great that people were actually afraid to leave their homes. You had no school life. You had no church life. You had nothing. It completely destroyed all family and community life. People were afraid to kiss one another, afraid to eat with one another. It destroyed those contacts and destroyed the intimacy that existed amongst people. If you look at some absenteeism from factories where we have data, it's astounding. Shipyards, uh, the workers there were told they were as important and as patriotic as soldiers on the front lines to build ships. There were doctors available in the shipyards and the factories. Doctors were not available anywhere else. And of course, in those days, if you didn't show up for work, you didn't get paid. Nonetheless, you have shipyard after shipyard on the East Coast reporting 46%, 55%. 60% absenteeism. In Philadelphia, uh, I quoted a, a doctor who was tending, working in an emergency hospital 12 miles from his home. And when he drove home each night, there were so few cars on the road, he started counting them. One night in a drive of 12 miles in what was then the third biggest city in the country, he did not see a single other car on the road. He said, the life of the city has almost stopped. In Wellington, New Zealand, at almost the exact same time, in the middle of the day, somebody stepped outside of his emergency hospital and saw nothing moving on the street except for an ambulance. He called Wellington a city of the dead. Victor Vaughn, who had been the dean of the University of Michigan Medical School, and was then the head of the Division of Communicable Diseases for the Army, a sober, serious scientist not given to overstatement, said if the current rate of acceleration continues for a few more weeks, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the Earth. So that's how it was in, in much of the United States and in other parts of, of the world. We talk a little bit about the, the pathology. You know, the overwhelming majority of seasonal influenza deaths are bacterial 
complications, secondary bacterial pneumonias, or some other complications, cardiovascular. The seasonal flu virus does not bind to cells deep in the lung. It binds to cells in the upper respiratory tract. Bird flu, there are two viruses that are circulating, H5N1 and H7N9. That only binds to cells deep in the lung, which is why it's so deadly, why it has 40, 50 percent mortality rate. But it does not bind to cells in the upper respiratory tract, which is why it is not easy to communicate. If it ever acquires that ability, the mortality rate would go way down, but it would still be very dangerous. The virus in 1918 could bind both to the upper respiratory tract, so it was easily communicable, just like seasonal influenza, and it also could bind to cells deep in the lung. So you not only had the bacterial pneumonia complications that we still face today, but if it bound to your cells in the lung, you were starting out essentially with viral pneumonia, not a good place to be. You know, the, there is a, no really satisfactory hypothesis as to why the uh, young adults suffered the most. All pandemics lower the average age of those who, of, uh, of those who die from compare, when compared to seasonal influenza, but none quite as dramatically as 1918. Uh, what seems to me the leading hypothesis, but it's not conclusive and not universally recognized, uh, is that your immune system is stronger when you're younger. And the immune system itself was overreacting and killing the patient. It's like in Vietnam when they had to destroy the village to save it. The immune system has very toxic weapons. If the virus is in the lung and the immune system is throwing everything it's got at that virus, the battlefield is your lung, and it's not a good result. Uh, let me talk about the morbidity. That varied from city to city. Uh, there were some very careful, well-done epidemiological studies after 1918. And they found that it ranged from a low of 15% morbidity to, to a high of 53% in San Antonio. In San Antonio, 90% of all households had at least one person who was sick. So what's going to, where are we now? What's going to happen next time? Because given the nature of the virus, there will be a next time. Uh, there are some additional problems that actually, in some ways, make us more vulnerable to influenza. Now, you don't need airplanes to spread in a pandemic. As I said earlier, you can, you know, the pandemics made it from Europe to America when it took you a couple of months to cross the Atlantic. Uh, but airplanes do spread things much, much, much faster than uh, sail. So that's one problem that makes things harder, the speed of spread. Uh, another problem, and this is significantly more important, I think, than anything else, we now have a just-in-time inventory system. You know, where do you think everything comes from? Not just for health care. I mean, your syringes are imported. You know, last Influenza season, there was a shortage of IV bags because they're made in Puerto Rico, and they were knocked out. But you could have alternative sources from Puerto Rico. You can't get alternative sources when there's a worldwide pandemic because everybody's short of them. Uh, you've got bottlenecks in transportation systems. You've got, I mean, basically every water purification plant in the country has roughly a three-day supply of chlorine. All that chlorine, most of it's imported, comes from Mexico. You know, when you have the whole supply chain interrupted, again, health care, antibiotics, gowns, gloves, all that stuff's imported. The uh, number of beds in hospitals has declined precipitously over the last few decades. 
because hospitals are now much more efficient than they used to be. Uh, efficiency is great, but if you need a surge capacity, that requires slack, and nobody's paying for any slack. So, and a third problem, which I don't think is clear, is will health care, I mean, I don't think the answer is clear, is will health care workers in a severe pandemic treat patients? In 1918, if you were a doctor, infectious disease was a very significant killer. That's not the truth anymore. So it's not a question of will health care workers personally be courageous enough to step forward, but are they going to want to go home and expose their own families to it? You know, this is an issue that, that could survey, could significantly curtail the number of health care workers available. Uh, so those are some of the problems that we would have to face that we didn't have to face earlier. What are the lessons from 1918? The first lesson is that communication is absolutely essential. I think it's the single most important thing other than a vaccine. You know, risk communication is sort of an esoteric fit phrase for telling the truth. It's one I don't like because it implies managing the truth. When you don't manage the truth, you tell the truth. Now, the picture I gave in 1918 of uh, society almost disintegrating, that wasn't always the case. The people who were informed about what they faced, and even somewhat prepared, responded very differently, whether that was the nurses, doctors, Red Cross. But there were a few cities that functioned pretty well. For example, San Francisco was one. In San Francisco, instead of saying it's ordinary influenza by another name, the mayor, the city council, union leaders, the business community all put their names on a full page ad with huge print that said, wear a mask and save your life. Now, the mask didn't do any good. They didn't know that. <laughs> but that is, that is a very, very different message from this is ordinary influenza by another name. They told the truth in San Francisco. San Francisco did function when they closed schools. The teachers volunteered as everything from ambulance drivers to telephone operators. Nobody starved to death in San Francisco because people were afraid to deliver food to the sick and so forth and so on. So you almost have a control to prove the point of how important the communication was. Don't manage the truth. Tell the truth. The second lesson involves non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs for short. In other words, what you do when you don't have a vaccine. And you can sum these things up under the phrase most, pretty much social distancing, which is self-explanatory. I, I don't really want to get into that in detail. If somebody wants to ask me a question about it, I will. I'll get, I will get into it. I, I was involved in the development of some of those. I'm somewhat of a skeptic of their effectiveness. But even the, the social distancing and other NPI measures uh, that you might take, that depends on compliance, on the public listening to you, believing what you're telling them, and following your advice. So it gets back to the communication again. Uh, give you an example of how important sustain and when you face a pandemic you're talking about weeks it generally takes between six to eight weeks for the disease to burn its way through a particular community so you're going to have to do something over a sustained period of time that is very difficult i'll give you a, a, an example in mexico city uh, the government recommended masks on public transportation. They handed out free masks. The Army was everywhere giving them out. You could get them at any time you got at a, at a bus stop or train, whatever. And usage peaked a few days after the recommendation at 
And four days later, it was off, fell off to 27 percent. Four days. So the idea that you're going to get massive long-term sustained compliance to your recommendations is one of the reasons, and the difficulty in doing that is one of the reasons I'm skeptical about how, how effective some of these NPIs will be. Uh, but I think the biggest problem, and I'm at 37 minutes, so I will now uh, better come close to closing. Uh, I think the biggest problem is politics. I talked about risk communication and so forth. In every pandemic plan that I know about, and I was involved in several, both at the federal level and several states and so forth, they all, you know, accept this idea that, that telling the truth is crucial. But the public health leaders are not necessarily going to be the ones in charge. There is a huge gap. You know, let's take Ebola, for example. What CDC said about Ebola a couple of years ago was great. But then you had individual governors paying no attention, whether it was Chris Christie or the guy in Maine. Do you think that Donald Trump is going to take the advice of the CDC director when it comes to making a wise, rational decision. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but even if it's, you know, Trump aside, that is a tough call. If you look back at our recent experience in pandemics, whether it was 2009 uh, with sort of the pandemic that wasn't, or Ebola, or, or other outbreaks in the not-too-distant past, there is this huge gap between the public health people who are very likely going to get it right, although maybe not, and the politician, the person who's really in charge. And I don't know how to bridge that, bridge that gap. That is probably the, the biggest problem that I think we face. And we got other big ones. Uh, on that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you're going to take a seat. And take my water out of the Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, John, we look forward to having you on the talk, talk to us a little bit more on the panel. And there will be time for uh, Q&A after we have a panel um, to talk, talk a little bit further to carry on this conversation about uh, could it happen today. So I want to introduce the moderator of our panel, Dr. Peter Buckley. Peter Buckley is the Dean of Medicine at the School of Medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. He uh, started his position there in January of 2017. He is also a psychiatrist with an expertise in schizophrenia and professor of psychiatry. He is also executive vice president of medical affairs for the VCU Health System. From 2010 to 2017, Dr. Buckley served as dean of the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University, and he also served for two years as the interim chief executive officer of Augusta University Medical Center and AU Medical Associates, and Executive Vice President for Health Affairs. In 2016, he was appointed as Executive Vice President for Medical Affairs and Integration. His previous academic appointments include serving as Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Case Western University School of Medicine in Cleveland. Please join me in welcoming Dean Buckley, who will introduce our other panelists. Um. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good evening. John, great, great Thank remarks. You. Thank you. Um, I thought John um, really brought the pandemic to life a uh, hundred years ago. And um, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about a time when my wife, Leonie, and I w visited Siena which was known as the birthplace of the plague. 
in uh, 13 and 20 something. And uh, I was thinking about just how likely and how the uh, similarities between the plague and the influenza uh, was. Uh, this is an auspicious place, of course, to have this discussion because of the long-standing uh, contributions of uh, this uh, museum. Uh, but also our institution contributed to um, really helping the influenza. And I think John described just that short period of um, in, engulfment all, almost of communities. And that happened here also in Richmond. And actually, our medical school class began on the 18th of September in, 18, in uh, 1918, the new class. And it was uh, auspicious for a number of reasons. Uh, it was also the first class that had a uh, female medical student, the first female medical student. And part was the reason because several of our um, doctors had gone off to uh, the First World War. And so there was a recognition both with that and with the suffragettes that there was a need to, um, to help. But what happened was very shortly thereafter, the medical students that were entering in training actually ended up uh, helping in Richmond and helping doctors all across the Commonwealth. And so the dean at that time, uh, Stuart Maguire, a descendant of, of course, the uh, Maguire dynasty, uh, petitioned the Surgeon General of America to allow the medical students essentially mask and behave as doctors, even though they're only medical students, for the very reason that you said the remarkable shortage. Three of the medical students died uh, due to the influenza, and their favorite uh, <coughs> professor of laryngology uh, died again, just like you said, uh, uh, John, because he, he was uh, tending to one of his ill family members and caught uh, influenza. And the Richmond Times Dispatch in October said that they pronounced the October as the saddest month in the, his, the medical history of this nation. And they indicated that thousands had, had contracted influenza and nearly a thousand people that month had died. And so the pandemic that John so eloquently and fiercely described to us as a worldwide pandemic with, with statistics that are really quite staggering it was also happening in our own backyard. And our institution and our personnel were stepping up to that, including in makeshift uh, uh, mass units and hospitals that, and hotels that were commandeered. And uh, another uh, little known fact about the influenza in our medical school is if you fast forward some uh, 70 years, and we trained one of our first uh, MD, PhD uh, uh, graduates. That's someone who's a doctor who's also trained as a scientist. It was a Dr. Jeffrey Tannenberger. And he went on to work and continues to work for the federal government. And he uh, discovered and sequenced the, um, the gene, the coding of the influenza in the 1918 influenza. And so our institution was there at the beginning. I didn't realize yeah. That was, I know Jeff. You know Jeff? Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize he, he was a graduate of our medical school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah. Uh, we'll talk a little about this later, but we also have had a long standing commitment not just to influenza, we also. Um, have been involved in, obviously, uh, the uh, Eb Ebola saga. Uh, we have a unique uh, pathogen unit so that if something like this happened and devastated our community, we have the resources to, uh, to manage that. We've been working on uh, a, a very uh, innovative work looking at whether vitamin C can help uh, people that have catastrophic uh, infection and, and sepsis. And so we've been involved in this. So for us to have the opportunity to be here 
at Jamie's uh, place this evening and to contribute is uh, both fitting and also something we feel very privileged about. And so I'm going to introduce two of our modern day experts that will come up and I'll ask them to come up and then I'll introduce them. And then I've got some really nasty questions that I'm going to ask them. <laughs> so Dr. Gonzalo Berman, please come up and Dr. Michael Dannenberg and please welcome both our colleagues. <laughs> Take a seat. Michael. Hi. So let me introduce our two colleagues. Mike's already mic'd up. That's most appropriate. <laughs> and uh, so let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Michael is new to, uh, <clears throat> to Richmond, and he came at just the tail end of 2016. He had spent uh, almost 30 years at University of Maryland. He is a graduate of Columbia University in New York and has also uh, trained at uh, Beth Israel and uh, at uh, Harvard and is a uh, renowned world expert on infectious diseases. He is a member of the American Society of Clinical Investigation, has over 100 uh, publications and is serving our community and our medical school as senior associate dean for research. So he really oversees our research portfolio. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Beware, there's some really nasty questions coming for you, sir. <laughs> Let me turn to the left here to Gonzalo uh, Berman, who uh, uh, trained at uh, SUNY also in the New York uh, system and uh, then trained and did a Master's of Public Health at uh, Cornell uh, University and has been a, uh, went back to SUNY for the rest of his training. And then we were extraordinarily fortunate that he joined us in 2003, I believe. Is That's that right. correct? correct? He's been 15 years uh, with us. He is a professor of medicine. He heads up the Division of uh, Infectious Diseases, and he is the person that our institution, our entire healthcare system relies on and set, uh, heads up our infectious epidemiology uh, program. If you think he goes, does a good job, uh, there is independent evidence of that, and that under his leadership, uh, just this year, our institution was recognized as one of 25 uh, institutions in the country for the quality of our management of infectious diseases. So please welcome both our colleagues. So uh, Michael, Barry mentioned this. You mentioned the issue uh, of uh, assortment. And so the influenza virus happened in 1918, and Barry mentioned other strains. How does that happen that an influenza virus changes over time? Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, I can expand a little bit about uh, what Mr. Barry said. And he's absolutely right that the, um, the virus mutates at an extraordinary rate. So it's always drifting. Mm -hmm. It's always changing little by little. and that helps the virus to uh, evade our immune responses. We may have had influenza last year, and we have antibodies that could protect us against the exact virus we had then. But the influenza we have this year is going to be slightly different, and different enough often that we can get sick again. And then he did also describe how if two cells get infected at the same time with two different viruses because of the unique um, arrangement of its genetic information, they just re it totally reassorts. The, what gets packaged into one viral particle is a random assortment of the genes that were yeah. present. And that can cause a major shift, a major change in the, um, in the composition of the virus, its ability to infect different populations. And also, uh, often, nobody's immune when that happens. And that's usually when the pandemics hit, because so few people are you know, protected from, pro from their prior exposure to influenza that everybody's susceptible. Because in essence, it's mutated in some kind of way, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, OK. 
Now, I mentioned at the beginning, and of course people, our uh, uh, audience are well aware that there's more out there than just influenza. So, Gonzalo, can you uh, tell us a little bit about, not too much about Ebola and Zika, but <laughs> just how does, this, how does this happen that there are uh, pandemics that come upon us and how prepared are we for that? So, there are multiple potential agents or viruses that can impact populations, particularly as human beings expand to new areas, new ecological niches. Uh, we become exposed or re-exposed to viral pathogens, for example. And as Mr. Barry alluded to already, although it's not necessary, it certainly helps to have airplane travel that allows us to have a case of, for example, of Ebola in Africa quickly transported to Europe or Asia or to North America. So we become particularly susceptible to those pathogens or viruses because of the rapidity of travel. Okay. And you also mentioned that, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know that you're heading into a, an, an, a uh, major epidemic, uh, that you may get an influenza or another virus and not obviously recognize the significance of that. But how do we come to awareness of that, either as an individual or as a community? What's the process? Because obviously, in 1918, this swept across the world in a very rapid way. And, and John mentioned the lack of communication as a factor in that. Well, local, state, and, uh, and US health departments are all over this. They're, they're always looking at the virus. For influenza, they're always looking at the viruses that are um, circulating right now, or uh, it tends to trade hemispheres. So when it's our summer, there are viruses circulating in the southern hemisphere. And uh, you know, in the winter time, we have them up here. They're always tracking them, sequencing them, finding out how they um, are evolving, trying to stay ahead of the curve to predict whether this next year is going to be a bad one because it's changed a lot. The virus has changed a lot or whether it's going to be very similar to the kind of viruses we had before. But then, you know, every now and then, out of nowhere, a new one will arise. When it does, I think we find out very quickly, but it can stymie sometimes or belie sometimes the predictions that were made just before that. I see. And in that kind of scenario, could, could our health system be overwhelmed by something like that? Yeah. As happened in 19. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, as Mr. Barry alluded to already, the biggest challenge of the healthcare system is that we live in just in time preparation generally, and that surge capacity can be stretched rather quickly. When, when, I, when I refer to surge capacity, it means not only personnel to take care of the patients, but the physical space, the personal protective equipment, um, the respirators or the ventilator machines, the medications, the vaccines, all those things can be stressed in real time. So, so that's why we have the unique pathogen so that we're unit. Can you tell people right. about a little bit about that and the state of readiness of that? Sure. So we're very fortunate at VCU Health to have one of the I think, 40 or 35 unique pathogens across North America or across the United States, in which we have a physical environment or physical area that is closed right now, but it opens up on call. There's 80 to 100 healthcare workers that are prepared and trained to deal with unique pathogens. The most recent one would be something like Ebola. And in that particular unit, we can take care of patients from start to finish, 100% contained with doctors and nurses, pharmacies, uh, laboratories, incineration um, facilities for medical waste, et cetera, et cetera. So we're capable of addressing very unique pathogens within the healthcare system to limited capacity, of course. Uh, but that makes us, or it makes VCU rather unique in the Commonwealth of Virginia and across most states uh, would have that particular capability. So now, <clears throat> I'm thinking after this evening, John, that there's going to be a dramatic increase in the number of people in this audience going out getting a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm predicting it. So, so, so Michael, tell us about vaccines for influenza and kind of give us the load down and the work of them. Well, Mr. Barry said that the, the most important thing in a, if a, a plague like that influenza comes uh, across again would be um, absolute truthfulness. And uh, uh, I'm going to stick with that. Influenza vaccine for an individual is not our best vaccine. 
it's not the best vaccine we have to prevent an infection. It's not comparable, for example, to our hepatitis A vaccine. It's a phenomenally effective vaccine. Influenza vaccine isn't perfect, and it's not perfect for a few reasons that we understand. We don't always get the match right with um, what, what this season's flu is, because uh, you have to predict that months in advance, and it can be different. And even so, even when the match is good, not everybody makes great antibodies to it, and not everybody is protected. So you may hear or have had the experience or hear of people who got vaccinated and got influenza anyway, and that can be discouraging. But don't let it discourage you <laughs> because it, getting vaccinated does, year after year, reduce your risk of having severe influenza and I'm guessing that the average age of this audience could possibly be in the range Careful. where severe influenza could be deadly. And so <laughs> lowering your risk just a little He's bit. He's not talking about you. Don't worry. <laughs> lowering your risk just a little is something very worthwhile to do. But even more important, when a large percentage of the population gets vaccinated, then influenza spreads in the community much less effectively. So it's kind of the thing, it's a kind of thing where if we have to all get on board, all get vaccinated, and then we're protecting ourselves a little and we're protecting each other a lot. I see. Okay, can I speak John? to that? Uh, one thing that, I mean, first, the actual numbers are discouraging. In the last 20 years or so, when they've been monitoring closely, the vaccine effectiveness has ranged from 14% to a high of 62%, and elderly have less uh, robust immune systems. Last year, it was 0% effective for people over 65, which is not very good. But <laughs> it's, still, it's still worth getting, because you don't know it's going to be 0% effective <laughs> if you're over 65. Uh, and Michael just, just said there are all sorts of other reasons to get it. And even at the 14% number, so many people get influenza that still ends up saving thousands of lives. CDC says that annual, I mean, just ordinary seasonal influenza is killed from a low of 3,000, ranges every year, varies from 3,000 to 56,000 Americans a year. Uh, but one thing I should have closed my talk with, which I was looking at my stopwatch instead of thinking, uh, <laughs> was actually a positive note. And that is the idea that, as, as everybody on the panel knows, you know, we've been working on a universal influenza vaccine for a while. That did not used to be a high priority until bird flu surfaced in 2004. We were spending more money on West Nile virus, which in its worst year killed 300 Americans compared to influenza killing 3,000 to 56,000. But we were spending more money on West Nile than we were spending on trying to develop a universal influenza vaccine, one that will work against essentially all influenza viruses, or at least those that are most likely. And there's enough work that's been, progress that's been made that uh, people think it is now likely that we can get that. Uh, but we don't know when. That, that is a very high priority now, and there is progress being made. If I can say one thing. Can you, also. can you address that as, as well, the progress that's been made in terms of new vaccines? Absolutely. And I'd also like to mention that we talk about vaccines and influenza vaccines, even when the shortcomings and its potential benefits, it's really important to, to underscore, to stress, it's generally very safe. So right, the right. adverse consequences right. of getting vaccinated, apart yeah. from having a sore arm for a couple of yeah. days, is actually yeah. minimal. If right. you think about some of the, the first tenet of medicine, at first, do no harm, we're actually not doing harm by vaccinating people. We're potentially helping them with very little risk. So that's great. In terms of vaccines improvements, uh, no doubt we're seeing some, uh, with respect to influenza, just novel approaches like giving higher dose for older patients. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really readily available three or four years ago, and now that's a routine approach. For those that have egg allergies, we have vaccine preparations that don't have egg, that aren't made in eggs per yeah. se, so that that egg allergy concern is erased. 
um, the, the fears. And then there's actually an influent, the vaccine, which you can basically snort up your nose. It's the flu mist. It's not the most exciting one. I've actually tried it. I did it one year. It has a terrible aftertaste, so that's the adverse effect. Uh, but for those that are scared of needles, those are you know, that, that group that just can't take the needles, you can have the flu mist up your nose. I'm, I'm so glad I'm, you're sitting over here and I'm not over here. Yeah. Uh, I think now would be a good time to throw open the questions, unless you have any other comments to, to I mention. I think I'd take one. a crack at the universal uh, influenza vaccine. Yeah, please. And just amplify what Mr. Barry just said. So this has become a major priority. It was a big announcement. Sorry. There was a big announcement uh, I got by so the National the Institute of, yeah, <laughs> of Allergy and Infectious Diseases about ramping up that effort just in February of this year. And um, there are some really exciting e approaches uh, trying to find the parts of the influenza virus that don't vary mm -hmm. from strain to strain and making new vaccines that are targeted against those more constant regions which haven't been very immunogenic before up till now. So if it's hard to make antibodies against those parts, um, but there's new combinations of, uh, of uh, or new vaccine technologies that are starting to uh, pay off that antibodies can, uh, can be made against these more conserved parts. We're years off still before we're testing them on people and, and finding out how effective they are. But just the, the amount of effort that's being put into this really important problem makes me very optimistic that someday we'll have an influenza vaccine that will rival that hepatitis A vaccine I just I mentioned yeah. before. And Jeff Tannenberger is at the forefront of that, isn't yeah. that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll go to uh, questions. I know we have roving uh, microphones, and obviously any of us on the panel will take a question at this stage. So I think we're going to, yeah? It was a, um, an informative talk. And we're, we're encouraged to hear it. As you do uh, look down the road, uh, you mentioned uh, it's a genetic mutation of the virus. Is there some work being done, research being done, uh, genetic research that might get out in front of the mutation? Well, I mean, I don't know if you'd rather. I mean, yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, there are people who are trying to predict and but it's you know, where the current threats may go. And there is certainly a lot of work on trying to figure out what makes a virus lethal uh, and you know, what, what genetic components are involved there. But it's such a random event. You know, we used to think that it was impossible that a virus had to reassort to infect a human. And then H5N1 came along and we discovered, no, it can jump directly from birds to people. You know, there are, most uh, scientists think that 1918 was a reassortment, but there is a, a minority of people, including, without a doubt, one of the leading influenza scientists in the world, who thinks it came through as a whole virus directly from, from birds. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, there are so many, there are, there are the H1N1, the H5N1, that refers to hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, the two antigens that stick out on, on the virus. And there are so many possible combinations of those, it's almost infinite. Uh, and while we used to think that it, there were only three viruses that cycled through the human population, now we're beginning to worry that, that no, it's a lot more complex on that. So I don't know if anybody wants okay. to add. Mike, do you want to add some more? Yeah, I'd jump in that um, the permutations are almost infinite and, and what's coming out, I think you, Mr. Barry pretty eloquently talked about how almost every possibility comes out and most of those viruses don't work, but the virus, if it thought about it, wouldn't care because um, some, <laughs> some do work. Um, but I think machine learning and artificial intelligence approaches are being brought to bear that, that will narrow down the possibilities, that will 
kind of help us to um, focus in on the, on the ones that are most likely to emerge in future? I think there's an opportunity there. Hmm. Okay, we have a number of hands. Hey. Yeah. Uh, in your talk, doctor, you said something about the body is fighting the infection and that outcome is not good. Uh, is there research going on that will be some type of um, uh, vaccine that will help us, help our body fight these things? And why is it that our body is killing us if, we're, if they're fighting an infection? Well, Great I question. think that, that is a very good question, and I could probably uh, bluff my way through that one, but I'm not a yeah, doctor, we, and we have two infectious disease well, experts. They can bluff their way. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for asking that question, and if they weren't here, I'd, I'd give you maybe a reasonable answer, but they'd probably start. give you a better sure. answer. I'm sorry, I can't see you anymore because of the bright lights. <laughs> the, the, the most simplified answer or approach would be is that we mount a response to an agent, whether it's a bacterium, a parasite, or a virus, and at times our immune response can overdo it. And we not only in the process either kill or attack the, the pathogen, but we also have collateral damage on our own tissues. In this situation, in influenza, it would be our lung tissues, uh, therefore that the lungs start to bleed or fill with fluid and water, and then we can't breathe anymore. There actually is a lot of science going uh, at play or at work right now, even at VCU Medical Center, with mega high doses of vitamin C, which is being infused to decrease that uh, auto-inflammatory response or that inf inflammatory response from the human body uh, against our own body uh, to improve outcomes. There's some very promising data to suggest that we can mitigate that and make it less intense to have better clinical outcomes while not, not impacting negatively our ability to fight off the pathogen. Yeah, that, I, Please. I could hardly add anything to that, but I'll, I'll try and add just a little. One is that um, <coughs> Dr. Bierman said mega doses, so taking like pills of vitamin C, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about <laughs> intravenous infusions in people who are very sick, mm. and, and um, some data that suggests that may actually work, and I think we're going to find out for sure whether it works pretty soon. Um, but I think part of the question was also like, how, why does that happen? And I, I think you can think about it this way. In evolution, um, interventions that help us survive are, and reproduce are, are favored and, and they increase in the population. This kind of, in, uh, our immune system isn't built to help you survive an overwhelming infection or a really, really big, you know, big dose or a big uh, attack by a very virulent organism. We just, there was no survival advantage in that. So the things that work to contain a small infection, when it's a big infection, we body just does it more. And it, now that we have modern medicine to help, that can be actually a foe. That can actually hurt. Great, great answers. Yeah. Carrying on a little bit about that, sometimes you don't have to have that massive uh, viral infection to trigger. You can have a very simple viral infection caused by maybe your, your vaccination. Mm -hmm. And two of your people in your book probably did that. I mean, Cushing and Franklin Roosevelt mm -hmm. probably had that later in their life and it's a, it's a carry on. And I think that the autoimmune system working at from the epidemiology standpoint, needs to be one way, but there's not very much you can see coming from the autoimmune system um, to help to help some of these things. And um, just um, wondered how the people who cannot take vaccines, how they can better protect themselves. Great question. I, I can't. Gonzalo, I mean, do you want to sure. take that question? Another great question. Right. So. I think that if one is unable to take or tolerate a vaccine, then the next step is, as Mr. Berry alluded to, are kind of more common sense interventions, social isolation, social distancing, avoiding crowds during the peaks of, of high respiratory infections, uh, actually very good hand hygiene, washing your hands 
before you eat, before you touch your mouth or your mucous membranes, uh, that goes a long way. And then now I'm going to go to almost sound like a country doctor here, but doing simple things such as keeping yourself well rested, hydrated, having your nutrition be good, uh, exercise is important for the immune systems. All those things can help to improve the immune system and lessen the risk of viral infections or common infections. Let me do it. say something about masks. Uh, I think surgical masks are useless in influenza, with the exception of, and they actually ran experiments even in 1918 and, and knew this. If you put a surgical mask on a sick person and is in the household, that will provide significant measurable protection of people who are healthy and, and wandering around the hospital, not at the household. I don't know if a mother will put a mask on a sick child, which is going to make the kid more uncomfortable. But if the parent knows that it's going to protect other kids, maybe they will. Uh, you know, in terms of influenza and pandemics and so forth, there's an N95 mask, which is sort of a respirator, uh, which will provide protection, but that's more complicated because it has to be worn properly, fitted properly. Uh, it's a lot harder to do than you would think. All these things have to be sustained. At the first meeting we had to talk about non-pharmaceutical interventions, we had a gentleman from Hong Kong who was in charge of the infection control the hospital that had by far the best record against SARS. Most of the SARS deaths were actually healthcare workers and suspected they infected themselves. They all knew what to do. All those healthcare workers knew what to do. But it goes back to use a football analogy again, Vince Lombardi blocking and tackling. The guy from Hong Kong at his hospital, there was absolute discipline absolute rigor, made sure every single time somebody took off their personal protective equipment, PPEs known in the trade, they were rigorous. And you only have to be careless once to infect yourself. That's one of the problems with N95s and some of the other things, and one of the reasons why I'm skeptical, skeptical about you know, just how effective some of these things will be. But you know, they will work if you do it right. Doing it right is, is not so easy. One last, one thing I should have mentioned in response to your question, sir, is that something that we consider like socially normal is the handshake. You meet someone, you yeah. give them a handshake. It's been well proven that you can transmit bacteria or viruses through a handshake. You know, maybe it's, you need to be rude sometimes and not shake people's hands. Perhaps you could seek an alternative. Uh, it's actually been studied that the fist bump <laughs> Because there's less surface area being involved, less, you know, less friction. It actually has a less of a chance or a decreased chance of transmission of a virus or a bacteria. So. Gonzalo, I thought you'd be an elbow. An you elbow do that too. Kind of guy. I can't reach him with an elbow. Oh, yeah. Roger? <laughs> uh, is the uh, vaccine I received this morning the same vaccine that uh, one would receive in Ireland or Japan or Brazil? Yeah, great question. Michael, you want to take that? Wait I believe that. it is. Yeah. I believe yeah. that all of the, uh, the CDC collaborates with the uh, World Health Organization and the European equivalents, and uh, they decide together what the most likely, you know, to try and predict next year's uh, epidemic strains or seasonal strains and, and give you the same, same vaccine. Is that, is that your understanding, Gonzalo? Absolutely. Yeah. I think Roger was trying to convince his wife, Anne, that he needs to go to Ireland to get there. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what the deal is with that. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Do we sorry, have one last question? It. Okay. I appreciate the, um, the uh, communication and transparency, uh, particularly stating that 0% uh, uh, efficacy. Um, Once. Uh, yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lots of questions. First one is uh, to, to Mr. Berry. What was the state of medical knowledge of the disease at the time, and how did they address it? I don't think that was uh, clear. Um, it was, and I don't know the history. Was, was hand-washing semmelweis already something that had been uh, – is that right? That, uh, was that already something that they were practicing or not? 
and, and then a couple other questions after that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the first part of the book actually is sort of a history of the development of scientific medicine. Uh, and we went, you know, for 2,000 years, doctors believed in bleeding patients. And there, I mean, I could actually get in, it wasn't as crazy as it seems to us. And there are reasons why it managed to survive for 2,000 years. But then in the early 1800s, France, and, you know, they started correlating results with treatments and realized maybe bleeding wasn't such a good idea. And meanwhile, scientific revolution, microscopes and so forth, and the germ theory, which by 1918 was well established, but, but wasn't that old. Uh, you know, I think the science that was being done in 1918 was extraordinary. But the knowledge base was not extraordinary. We didn't know what a virus was in 1918. Didn't know what they knew that they were what they called filterable viruses. All infectious organisms were referred to as viruses. A filterable virus was one that was so small it would go through a really fine filter. They, they didn't know if that was a different organism, which actually came out of influenza research, but not till the 20s. Um, they discovered it was a different kind of organism as opposed to just a really, really small bacteria. Uh, they did some remarkable things uh, in pneumonia. Uh, I think the pneumonia vaccine we have today is probably a direct descendant of, of the work that was done back then. Uh, you know, so there were some great scientists working, but the knowledge base was not there. Uh, and then what was your second question? Just to follow up, because I know the questions are limited. Um, we, we will have a chance after. So great. The, the, um, Non-pharmacological interventions, by the way, my father was a medical doctor, may he rest in peace, I have great reverence for his memory and uh, medicine in general. Um, what alternatives were offered and what were the characteristics of the outliers? Were there any patterns that seemed to develop that, that yeah. for instance, a country doctor might have observed? There, are, I mean, you, I remember now you asked about hand washing, there, there was actual, you know, some data, I'm, most of this stuff was published, but no, nobody today pays any, has, has seen it. Modern epidemiologists haven't looked at a lot of this old data. Uh, that relates to hand washing, uh, it was published in like 1919, 1920 with sample size of a couple hundred thousand from institutions, uh, not directly with hand washing, but it relates to hand washing that actually would suggest it was pretty effective. Uh, I know some people today who don't believe that data. Uh, and, but, you know, they were aware because of the germ theory uh, that hand washing would be useful. Uh, there were some other recommendations. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, the social distancing, most, most, cities close schools and ban public gatherings and things like that. Uh, not everybody. Uh, there has been, since the emergence of bird flu, uh, some a very considerable effort to look at what was done in 1918 in different cities and to correlate the, what we now call NPIs, when they were uh, it implemented and how those cities did. One of the, I, I'm an outlier because I think that that historical research was deeply flawed and that the data is go, that has gone into a lot of those models is, is very, very weak. Uh, for example, you know, uh, you know the, those modelers look at St. Louis because it perfectly fits some model Predictions. St. Louis had a relatively mild uh, outbreak, relatively benign compared to other cities, uh, and they acted pretty early in, in implementing some of these things. And the modelers argue that that was because of the implementation of the NPIs. I say St. Louis had a spring e epidemic, and you know I don't often write 
scientific journal articles, but I took some data and worked with some friends of mine who are epidemiologists at NIH, and we found that first wave exposure provided anywhere from 59% to 89% protection against this lethal wave. If you got sick in the, or exposed in the spring, you got up to 89 and 94% protection against death. And you can compare that to the numbers I gave you earlier about the modern vaccine from 14% to 62%. So I think the first wave accounts for a lot of the effects uh, that they attribute to, because not every city had a first wave. Like Los Angeles didn't record a single influenza death in the spring. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going on too long. But it's part of what, you know, I was part of those efforts on NPIs. I support a lot of the uh, recommendations, uh, but I'm much more skeptical, uh, not only because of the issue of sustainability and compliance, but also because I don't think most of those models, in fact, I know they didn't, uh, most of those models didn't look at potential other reasons like the spring wave exposure uh, before they reach their conclusions. Thank, thank you for your work, John. <laughs> Please also thank Gonzalo and Michael for their work. I, I, I got to say, this just flew by. So now, now, let me introduce to make concluding remarks Mr. Harry Thalheimer. And Harry and his family have been terrific supporters of this community and of our institution. And uh, Harry has been on the board of MCV Foundation since 2019 and is current chair. So thank you, Harry. Thank you, Peter. And knowing that I stand between you and drinks and food, I will be brief. John Barry, thank you. Terrific, terrific story. Horrible, horrible tales. So compelling and so connected to Richmond. Peter, thank you again for an outstanding job of moderating. Dr. Bierman, Dr. Donenberg, thank you for your insights again. Jamie, uh, to your staff at the Virginia Museum for History and Culture, thank you for hosting this and working with us so closely. Margaret Ann and Brian from the MCV Foundation, great work. Thank you very much for what you've done with the staff. Board members of the MCV Foundation, the Virginia Historical Society, thank you for being here. And members of the MCV Foundation Leadership Council, thank you for being here. And for those of you who are in attendance, thank you. The numbers speak for themselves. We're a much bigger crowd than we were last time. We'll be even bigger next time. Briefly, it's an honor to serve as chairman of the board of the MCV Foundation to further our work to support what outstanding things are being done on the MCV campus of ECU Health in treatment and care and education and research, new discoveries, new cures, new techniques, new innovations, and so much collaborative work that's taking place. We tell the story, we share the news with events and partnerships just like this. We help raise the necessary funds to continue to do the great things that are happening on our campus and build for the future with staffing, programs, research, and facilities. We serve as stewards of contributed funds through strategic and sound investing, along with prudent distribution of those earnings on those funds in accordance with our donors' wishes. And I can tell you, it's not only something a source of pride of being chair of the MCV Foundation, but to sit with people like this who are sitting here on our faculty and on our staff doing the work that they're doing leading the country who can articulate so clearly as one of us. It's real, really a pleasure and an honor and I, I thank you all for that. This has been a great evening following up on last year's program celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant at MCV. We filled the room and we will see you in 2019. The date will be announced where the topic will be cancer which we know affects so many of us in so many ways. <laughs>
I'm expecting it will be a spillover crowd, and I understand there's a separate room here with big screens, and we'll be serving beer and popcorn in this. So get here er in that room. So get here early. So now I want us to all go upstairs and enjoy the food and drink that will be there and take the opportunity to get to know our panel who will be there to talk with you and answer your questions. And again, I cannot thank you enough, uh, but again, I'm also an ex-retailer and my job is to sell things, so <laughs> you may buy this upstairs. <laughs> and John will sign it for you upstairs at the island in, in the middle of the, of the lobby. And as you leave, we have all kinds of materials that VCU Health and MCV Foundation have put out that you will find interesting. Please make sure you take these home. We're very proud of the publications that we do. This partnership is a, a really a, a testament to uh, great thinking on behalf of Mr. Austin Brokenborough, who said this was something that we could fill the house on to, to tell and share with you the great things that are happening down on our campus. You all have health care needs, and we're there to serve. And as part of this community, we're an economic engine that working together, uh, we could really do great things. And I'll close with a, with a little anecdote that's appropriate. At the end of a Jewish wedding, we break a glass. <laughs> and this marriage between the Virginia Historical Society and the MCV Foundation has been blessed. So <laughs> we'll see you upstairs. Thank you for coming. <laughs>